Thank you for joining us once again on our live Saturday talks here from the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy. Happy 4th of July to everybody in the United States. You know what? Around the world. Today we celebrate the independence of America, but also for all peoples who are tuning in from all our allied nations like the Philippines and over in Europe and whatnot, Africa. And so we're very grateful that you could join us. I'm I'm Father Chris Alar, one of the Marians of the Immaculate Conception, and today we're doing a different talk from last week, but a continuation. Now, if you missed last week, that's perfectly okay. You can pick right back up with us. We're going to be doing Divine Mercy 101, but part of this day of prayer is I'm also going to work in prayers for our country, for our people, for our nation, and um, you can also, we can see with others like Joan and Dave Maroney on DivineMercyForAmerica.org. You can join them for prayers today. Marie Romagnano and the healthcare professionals for Divine Mercy. You can also see a lot of resources there. But today, and if you look on your screen, this is a continuation of my DVD series that I've been doing the last several weeks and will be continue to do called Explaining the Faith. Now you can get this on shopmercy.org. It's 13 talks of what I've been doing the last several weeks. You can put them all together or you can call 1-800-462-7426, basically 1-800-4-MARIAN to order a copy. They're $14.95 or as well, you can go ahead and get them live streamed on the divinemercy.org slash explaining the faith if you prefer to live stream them. So thank you again for joining us as we do a day of prayer for the United States. We'll be talking more about that, but let's pick up where we left off last week. And again, it's okay if you missed it. On your screen, I'm going to refresh the last slide that we left called what I refer to, or many brothers do, finch, like the little bird, F-I-N-C-H. This is the devotion of divine mercy that if you remember from last week, we explained the ABCs or the AB, uh, excuse me, ask for God's mercy, be merciful to each other and completely trust. God has been trying to give us that to the world for centuries and finally he gets to St. Faustina and on your screen right now you see how he used St. Faustina to get that message of mercy to the world. These are the five new channels of grace. Again, on your screen, we're going to start with F, which is the Feast of Divine Mercy. Then we're going to go into I, the Image of Divine Mercy, N, the Novena of Divine Mercy, C, the Chaplet of Divine Mercy, and H, the Three O'Clock Hour of Divine Mercy. Okay, so these are the slides, or the topics, I should say, that we're going to cover today. Now, in 1931, Jesus gave St. Faustina these new five channels of grace. And this is where we left off last week. Now, what's very important about it is that very first one. Let's start there. And if you look on the next slide, you see Divine Mercy Sunday with a big crowd. There's a big crowd there at the shrine. You see Brother Mark and me down there, right? Amongst the other 20,000 people. Can you see that? Uh, just kidding. But you can see those are the types of people that we pack in here. Well, that was pre-coronavirus, of course. But this Feast of Divine Mercy is very critical. And that is what I wanted to start with today. All right. You hear it all the time. The Feast of Divine Mercy. But do you know how to prepare for it? What to do to get those graces? In fact, do you even know what those graces are? Right now, we're going to tell you. So stay with us. All right. When is Divine Mercy Sunday? Well, hopefully most of you know. And if not, that's okay. You're going to learn something very important today. It's the Sunday after Easter. Now, the Sunday after Easter is what John Paul II designated as Divine Mercy Sunday. And this is very important. Why? Because in the Jewish tradition from what we come, uh, we Christians come from the Jews, when a feast was so big 
that it couldn't be celebrated in one day. They would celebrate it over eight days and they would call it an octave. And now we used to have many octaves in the Catholic Church. We had the octaves of Corpus Christi and the octave of Pentecost. In fact, just a few days ago, we celebrated Peter and Paul. That used to have an octave, right? And so right now, what we are <clears throat> looking at are only two octaves left in the church today. There's only two. The two big ones, Christmas and Easter. When does the Christmas octave begin? Let's start with Christmas. And when does really Christmas begin, the Christmas season? And I always laugh, don't say the day after Thanksgiving. No, that's commercialism. Christmas begins on Christmas Day, the 25th. So if you can see my fingers here, the 25th is the first day of Christmas or the uh, Eve 24th if you celebrate Vespers. But the 25th Christmas Day is day one. The 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th, 30th, 31st, January 1st. The eighth day of the Christmas octave is Mary, the mother of God. So why do we go to church every, every year on January 1st? As I always like to say, to pray Michigan wins the college football Rose Bowl? No. To pray for a happy new year, Father? No. Well, I mean, that's not a bad thing. But what it is, is the celebration of the solemnity of Mary, the mother of God. Eight days, they are bookends of the same feast. So the birth of Jesus and on the 25th of December, Mary the mother of God on January 1st, they're bookends of, believe it or not, the one great feast called Christmas. Now, what's even bigger than that is Easter, the Easter octave. And it starts with, you guessed it, Easter Sunday, day one. So we have Easter Sunday, day one. Then we have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Divine Mercy Sunday, the eighth day. Now being an octave, that means that from, from the day of Easter, Easter Sunday, until the following Sunday, Divine Mercy Sunday, the church celebrates this as one big feast. And guess what? You can't get a bigger feast the entire year than that of, of Easter. And it's bookend from Easter Sunday to, you guessed it, Divine Mercy Sunday. Now, why eight? Okay, this is important. What was the perfect number to the Jews? And everybody says seven. And I say, seven, yes. But what is that in regards to? Seven is in regards to time. It's the number eight that is eternity. Now it's funny because in a few minutes, you know, I sent a video out uh, a few days ago that showed the image of divine mercy and what I believe to be a miraculous image. Um, and you may have seen my video where this one individual, I'm not saying that every time you burn an image of divine mercy, that this will happen, but for this one woman it did, and you may have seen where the image didn't burn. That is an icon, which is a window to eternity. And we're gonna be talking about this image more in just a few minutes. So if you're tuning in to see more about that unburned image, stay with us, we're getting there. But the reason I bring it up is because an icon of Christ, like divine mercy, is a window to eternity. So while the number seven represents time to the Jews, eight represents eternity. Now this is where it gets important. All right. On the eighth day, we will enter into eternity. So think of it this way. Day one, as I just told you, is Easter Sunday. The next seven days, because seven represents time, is us walking through our pilgrimage called life, like the Jews in the desert, wandering around looking for the promised land. So then after their journey, they could enter into the promised land, all right? 
Day one is Easter Sunday. The next seven days are us wandering around in this valley of tears called life. This is our pilgrimage looking for the promised land. What is the promised land? The eternity of heaven. So on that eighth day, we will enter into eternity. It just so happens that that eighth day is divine mercy Sunday. So what does God want? Well, when Jesus comes to claim his bride, he'll do it on the eighth day because that's when he takes her into eternity. Now, if you tuned into my talks here on Saturday a few weeks ago, you heard me say that when we come to mass, who's the groom? Jesus. Who's the bride? We are. And Jesus comes for us to unite with us and literally enters into us. And we, the two become one. Now, symbolically, this eight days applies to our life too. Day one, Easter Sunday, Jesus opened the door to heaven on Easter Sunday. Now the next seven days, we're trying to get there. So think of Jesus way off in the distance. On Easter Sunday, he opens the door. Then he calls us, come here. Well, you got to get through these few landmines called life to find that open door. But once you get to that open door, you can enter in for eternity. The problem is, are those seven days called life in between? We hope we don't fall into pits. We hope we don't run the other direction. We hope that we continue moving forward to that open door called heaven. And when we get there, we enter into eternity. Now, Jesus is going to come on eternity for his bride. Now, the problem is, in order for him to take his bride to meet his mother and father, which, by the way, what did every Jewish man want his his bride to be before he took her home to meet his mother and his father? The answer is spotless. Jesus needs us all spotless before he can take us home to meet his mother and his father. So when he comes on the eighth day to get us, what's he going to find? Is he going to find us ready and spotless? Or is he going to find us with a little stain or maybe bigger stain on our wedding garments? What's our wedding garments? Our soul. Because remember the mass, if you were to listen to my talks a few weeks ago, if not, get the DVD. The wedding, excuse me, the mass is a wedding. Christ is the groom, we are the bride. The church is the bride, we are the church. So on this eighth day, Jesus will come for his bride and he wants to take us to meet his mother and his father. The problem is we must be spotless to enter in to those doors of heaven. Scripture tells us nothing unclean enters into heaven. We must be cleansed. But we may have two stains on our soul. There's two stains that we might have that we got to get rid of. And guess what? I'm going to tell you right now what they are and how to get rid of them. So that you listening, no matter if you're in the Philippines, if you're in the United Arab Emirates, which I got, by the way, shout out on your, uh, while you're listening, where you're from. We love to hear uh, where you're from. So say, Father, listening from Texas, listening from Alaska, listening from Philippines, listening from Canada, listening from, I even got one. Um, I got one from Bahrain. Uh, we got one listening from Saudi Arabia, which is interesting because Christianity there is not popular. So God bless you. We got others from Africa, from Europe, all over Portugal, Germany. God bless you all. So give us a shout out where you're, where you're uh, watching from. But anyway, what happens when Jesus comes to get us, as I said, we might have some stain on our soul. And right now I'm going to tell you how to get rid of it. All right. Number one, these two stains, what are they? Well, the first stain is sin. If we have any stain on our soul, it usually starts with sin. So if you have that stain, how do you get rid of it? This is an easy one. You go to confession. And as you heard me say a couple weeks ago in my talk on confession, again, if you missed it, get the DVD, that when you go to confession, you are cleansed spotless. You are spotless. But when you come out of the confessional, 
although the sin is forgiven, what about the punishment? Does that remain or is that gone too? What do I mean by punishment? Well, maybe that's not a good word. That is not a good word. And look at the next slide. See the absolution there? This is a priest, God bless him, giving an army officer uh, absolution. This is how you get rid of the first stain called sin. See that right there? All you got to go. When that priest says you are forgiven, you are guaranteed forgiveness. Is it the priest who forgives the sins? You heard me say it before. Yes. Father, what are you talking about? No, the grace comes from God, of course. But he delegated the authority to give, forgive sins to the priest. So as that slide showed, when that priest forgives your sins, you're forgiven. But what about the punishment? Does the punishment remain or is that gone too? Well, that's interesting. While the sin is washed away in confession, because the priest, when he says you're forgiven, is forgiven. Well, Father, what if, uh, what if the priest says I'm forgiven, but I'm really not? You are guaranteed forgiveness if the priest says you are forgiven. There's no wondering, am I forgiven or maybe I'm forgiven? Every single sin is forgivable, except one not asking for the mercy of God. That's a sin against the Holy Spirit. So as long as you walk into that confessional and you want to be forgiven, you cannot be guilty of the only unforgivable sin. The only unforgivable sin is not wanting or asking for the mercy of God. By very, the fact that you're going into the confessional, you're asking for the mercy of God. So there's no other sin that can't be forgiven. Now, once that sin is forgiven, what about the temporal punishment. Now the eternal punishment is gone, hell, meaning once you go to confession, the eternal punishment of hell is gone forever. You cannot, unless you sin again mortally, right? But for the sins you've committed in the past, it's gone. Now, that temp excuse me, that's the eternal punishment due to sin. But what about the temporal punishment, AKA purgatory? Like, okay, I can be forgiven for yelling at my cameraman, Giuseppe. So let's say that my cameraman, Giuseppe, and this is a true story, after I do a whole talk, tells me that I got to redo it. And I say, why? And he says, because I forgot to hit record. <laughs> Now, if I yell at my cameraman, Giuseppe, and I get impatient or I get a little bit angry, even though I love my cameraman, Giuseppe, I confess that that sin is forgiven. Anger and impatience, that sin is forgiven. And I asked Giuseppe to forgive me. He actually said, have mercy on me. When I went to yell at him, I actually couldn't. I couldn't make the words out of my voice because the Lord held back my yelling at him like St. Faustina when she was praying the chaplet and the angel tried to strike a pole and he couldn't strike because she prayed the chaplet. So when Giuseppe said, have mercy on me, I couldn't yell. It was funny. But let's say though, the other times I get upset or angry or impatient, I confess them. When I go to the confessional, those sins are forgiven. The wound is healed, but the scar remains. I still have to make atonement for that scar, even though I've been forgiven. It's kind of like the boy who breaks the window when dad says, don't play baseball in the yard. And the dad goes to work and the boy plays baseball. And then the ball goes through the window, breaks the glass. Dad comes home, sees the boy. The boy's really sorry. He says, I'm sorry. Dad says, I forgive you. But then is that it? Can he run out and play now? Uh-uh. The dad says, I forgive you, but you're grounded for two weeks. And you got to pay for this out of your allowance. So you see the temporal punishment or what I call loving discipline, even after forgiveness of sins, most likely remains. Now, not always, if you have perfect contrition or you do prayer, fasting, and almsgiving with perfect love, or you do a plenary indulgence with absolutely no attachment to sin. Remember, one of the conditions to a plenary indulgence is no attachment to sin. 
Now, if you do that, yes, you can still get wiped clean, not only of the sin, but also the punishment. Now, most of the time, we're not able to do that. I could do prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, but if I don't have perfect love, I'm not going to get the full merits. Like, if I want to fast for the love of God, but I end up liking it because I lose weight and I think I look better, uh, which somebody told me the other day about that, I laughed. Nah, there's a little self-love there. You're not going to get the full benefit. Or if you want to do almsgiving, you not write a nice big check for your church, but then you want your picture in the bulletin. Nah, that's a little self-love there. You're not perfect. Or if you do prayer, but in your prayer, you're asking for what you want rather than what God wants. There's a little self-love there. So prayer, fasting, and almsgiving is good, but you may not have perfect love. What about plenary indulgences? You all get scared of those because you heard the church used to sell them. Well, you know what? Plenary indulgence is, is, is like a car. A car is good by itself. I could get in the car and I can do something good, like drive to church. Or I could do something bad and go run over a bunch of people at, at a, a park. This would be bad. So the tool could be used for the good or the bad. Same with indulgences. They were given by the church as something good to forgive not only sin, but all the punishment due to sin. Or they could be used for bad, like sometimes the people sold them. That's not right. But a plenary indulgence is doing something like this. There are many plenary indulgences, but I'll give you just a few. Do you know that praying a rosary inside a church or chapel can be a plenary indulgence or with another person? Do you know that a half an hour of adoration before the Blessed Sacrament, whether it's in the tabernacle or exposed, can be a plenary indulgence? Do you know that um, walking the stations of the cross can be a plenary indulgence? Or this one you can do today on your couch. Half an hour of scripture can be a plenary indulgence. Now, why do I keep saying can be a plenary indulgence? And what is a plenary indulgence? Again, it forgives not only all the sin in confession, but all the punishment due to sin, the remission of all those sins you confessed. So the, the forgiveness comes in confession, the relief of the punishment comes by doing the indulgence. Now, I know this is a little confusing, but I explain it a lot better on my DVD. But the conditions for a plenary indulgence are this. One, if you do one of those four things, or many others, you have to go to confession, which no problem, that's not, that's not hard, within 20 days before or after. If you're not in a state of grace, you need to go to confession 20 days, within 20 days before. Or if you're in a state of grace, you could go up to 20 days after. Next, you got to go to Holy Communion. you got to receive Holy Communion. If you can't physically, because your church is closed, you make a spiritual act of communion. Kind of like confession. If you can't get to confession, make a spiritual act of contrition. Then, so after you've been to confession, you've been to Holy Communion, next you pray for the intentions of the Holy Father, which can be through like an Our Father, Hail Mary, Glory Be. So far, so good, right? These aren't hard. Confession, communion, and prayers for the Holy Father and our Father, Hail Mary, Glory Be. But it's the last condition that sinks most all of us. No attachment to sin, even venial. Good luck with that one. As I said, I still get impatient or yell at my cameraman, Giuseppe, or I get gluttonous at the dinner table, whatever it might be. So this is difficult for us to be ready on the eighth day when Jesus comes, on that eighth day when we enter into eternity, if we have either stain on our soul of sin or the punishment due to sin, we can't get to heaven. We need to wipe those away. How are those wiped away? Those two stains on our soul, our wedding garment, I told you the first one, which is sin, you wipe that away in the confessional. The second stain is the punishment that you get to st st because of sin. I said you can wipe that with perfect love and prayers, fasting, and almsgiving. I said you can wipe that off if you have an indulgence, plenary indulgence, but you have no attachment to sin. 
Good luck with that one. How do you do it? Well, the problem is most of us can't. And God knows that. So he gives us one more way. One more way God gives us to wipe our soul completely clean so we're ready to enter into heaven. And that one more way I'm going to show you now on the slide, on your screen, this one more way is Divine Mercy Sunday. The Feast of Divine Mercy. Let's read that on that screen. This comes from the most important slide in the di or, uh, paragraph I feel in the diary. So this is the one day that our Lord gives us an opportunity to be wiped completely clean. Let's read this. On that day. What day? Divine Mercy Sunday. The very depths of my tender mercy are open. I pour out a whole ocean of graces upon those souls who approach the fount of my mercy. Now here it is. Please listen. This is what we call the extraordinary promise. Jesus makes this incredible promise. If you do two simple things, you should be doing as Catholics anyway. And even non-Catholics can if they make a spiritual act of contrition and a spiritual communion. But here it is. The soul that will go to confession and receive holy communion shall obtain complete forgiveness of sins, the first stain, and all punishment, the second stain. So guess what? On this day, Divine Mercy Sunday, your soul can be wiped clean on all accounts if you've been to confession and now you receive Holy Communion, you will be spotless. There's no sin or punishment. He says, I wipe it all away. And I can enter into eternity. You don't think this is coincidental? God set it up this way so that on that day, the eighth day, when he comes to get you, you're ready. And all those other ways that make us possibly ready, like prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, we need perfect love. That's hard. Plenary indulgence, we need no attachment to sin. That's hard. But divine mercy Sundays for the rest of us, the sinners like me, that we can receive this grace of complete forgiveness of sin and punishment by doing only two simple things we should be doing anyway, confession and holy communion. Wow. Well, Father, can non-Catholics get this grace? Yes. If they truly ask God for the forgiveness of their sins by an act of contrition and want to be united truly with God in his heart by asking for a spiritual communion. But the surest guaranteed way is through the physical receiving of the sacraments. That's all Divine Mercy Sunday is, is a return to the sacraments of confession and communion. And now he's given you the ultimate reason to want to do it to be ready on the eighth day to get into heaven. This is awesome. So what do you do? Never will your soul be cleaner other than it is at the moment of your original baptism than it is on Divine Mercy Sunday. So you know that old expression, if I get run over by a bus, I hope it's after coming out of confession. Well, I change that to say, you know, if I'm ever going to get run over by a bus, I hope it's after receiving Holy Communion on Divine Mercy Sunday after having been to confession. Because then all my sins and punishment are wiped away. You know when John Paul II died? He died after receiving Holy Communion on Divine Mercy Sunday. And somebody says, well, Father, he died the night before. No, it was Divine Mercy Sunday in the Philippines and John Paul II is the Bishop of Rome and the Shepherd of the Universal Church. So he has all of the Philippines and Far East, which it already was Divine Mercy Sunday. And he, he had been to confession the day before, and he received Holy Communion on the vigil of Divine Mercy Sunday, which totally is acceptable. This is powerful stuff, everybody. Now, how do you get this grace? All right, Father. You told me I got to go to confession. I will. Now, if I can't, if my churches are closed, make an act of contrition. And Father, I can't get to receive Holy Communion in the Eucharist. Make an act of Holy Spiritual Communion. And what you do, hopefully next year, as our churches will be open. And we pray for this. So you want to see this grace? Start preparing now. And here's what you do. Next Divine Mercy Sunday. 
after having been to confession, and it doesn't have to be on Divine Mercy Sunday, you can go to confession before, as long as you're in a state of grace. You go to confession on Divine Mercy Sunday or the vigil the night before, you receive Holy Communion. Then after you do, go back to your pew and you make this prayer or something like it. So I suggest all of you write this down or replay this video. Don't worry, it'll be, it's on my DVD and you can replay this video on Facebook or our Divine Mercy YouTube channel. After you've been to confession on Divine Mercy Sunday and you receive Holy Communion, go back to your pew and simply make a prayer like this. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, you promised St. Faustina that the soul that has been to confession, I have. And the soul that receives Holy Communion, I just did. Or again, making a spiritual act of contrition or act of commu um, spiritual communion. You promised the soul that's been to confession I have and the soul that receives Holy Communion I just did will receive the complete forgiveness of not only all sins, but all punishment due to sin. Lord Jesus Christ, please give me this grace and he will or his promise was invalid. And that ain't happening. So you can make this promise, receive this grace, but you gotta have a heart that wants to change from sin, a rectification of the will. Divine Mercy Sunday is just simply returning to the sacraments. Why? Because this is where our faith is. The source and summit of our faith is Holy Communion. Let's look at the next slide. Speaking of Holy Communion, I think this is really powerful. This, you think Eucharistic miracles are just from the Middle Ages? Look at this screen. This is a Eucharistic miracle that happened recently. Let's read it. This is a Eucharistic miracle on Christmas 2013, confirmed in Poland by Bishop, I have no idea how to pronounce that name, um, and by the Vatican. And it said, the final medical statement by the Department of Forensic Medicine found that in the histo histopathological image, the fragments of the host were found containing the fragmented parts of the cross steriated muscle. It is most similar to the heart muscle. Tests also determined the tissue to be of human origin and found that it bore signs of distress. Wow. That is a Eucharistic miracle. You know, we see so many of these. You know, the church fathers, I've been doing talks on Mary in the Eucharist for years. For 1,500 years after Christ, that was the two topics the church fathers focused on the most, Mary and the Eucharist. Our loved ones who are not Catholic, simply ask them, do you think that 1,500 years of church fathers is unimportant? No, I think it was important, they'll say. Well, they talked about Mary and the Eucharist more than anything else. These Eucharist miracles are signs of God, and they all have similar characteristics. Like, for instance, the blood is always the blood of the universal receiver. And I can never remember if that's AB positive or AB negative, because he receives everyone into his heart. It's always human heart tissue. We had a, a, a Dr. Castingyong give us our retreat a few years ago, and he said that he sent these the Eucharistic miracles, uh, the, the hosts into labs, and they all came back human heart tissue. This is impossible. Has to be miraculous. They only have the Y chromosome, which means there's no earthly father. How do you explain that? It's human blood, but there's no earthly father? This is amazing. He leaves his body and blood in the form of a host so he can remain with us, as the Bible says, until the end of time. He's always present with us. All right, let's move on to the next one. I'm sorry I'm running behind, but the next is the image of divine mercy. 
Let's look at that image right now. And I'm going to have Brother Mark hold this on the screen for quite a while while I walk around the entire image because this is so powerful. Now, the Holy Father once said that the greatest images of Christianity are the images that best capture the Paschal mystery. Now, I want you to stay with me as we keep this image on the screen because I'm going to walk through the whole Paschal mystery with you because this is the only image in all of the history of Christianity that captures the entire Paschal mystery which makes it the greatest image. Let's look at this. Now, when does the Paschal mystery begin? What is the Paschal mystery? It's the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the first part of that Paschal mystery began on Holy Thursday in the upper room. Now look at that image. How do you see Holy Thursday in the upper room represented in this image? First of all, look at Jesus' attire. He's wearing kind of like what a priest, Catholic priest wears called an alb. It's like a white robe. He's the new high priest, replacing the Old Testament high priest, the line of Aaron, right? Now, secondly, he instituted the Eucharist. And what do we see on this image coming from the heart? The precious blood. So Holy Thursday is captured in this image. What was the next day? Uh, uh, excuse me, the next day in the Paschal Mystery was Good Friday. How is Good Friday captured in this image? Yeah, this is a little hard to see. When you blow it up, you can see it. The wounds in his hands and feet. Good Friday is captured in this image. Next, what happened was Easter Sunday. How was Easter Sunday captured in this image? Christ is resurrected. Notice the halo around his head. He's glorified. He's in his glorified state. Easter Sunday is captured in this image. What happened 40 days after the resurrection? This one's a little trickier. The ascension. Now, how does the ascension captured in this image? Scripture tells us that before Christ ascended back to the Father, he blessed all those present. There was like 500 people present. Look at Jesus' right hand. It is raised at shoulder length, shoulder height, and he's bestowing upon you, like he did the people before him when he ascended to the Father, a blessing. That's a traditional form of Jewish blessing. So the ascension is captured in this image because he's blessing those before him like he did before he ascended to the Father. Then 10 days later after the ascension, and the ends the Paschal mystery, Pentecost. And what is Pentecost? The coming of the Holy Spirit. And how do you see in this image the coming of the Holy Spirit? The blood and the water coming out of the heart of Jesus. That is the Holy Spirit. The church was born of the Holy Spirit. The church was born of blood and water. This is everything in the Paschal mystery. Now let's continue to look at that blood and water. That blood and water that's coming from the heart of Jesus now let's first ask the question, why is it coming from the heart? Doesn't the Bible say that when Jesus was stabbed by the spear, blood and water came out his side? Yes, it does. But Dr. Stackpole, the theologian who works for us up here, says that when the Roman executioners, they were skilled killers, and they knew where to stab the spear to go through someone's rib cage to instantly go through the ribs and puncture the heart. When Jesus was stabbed on the side, the spear went through his chest and punctured the heart. So the blood and the water that came out of his side, as it says in scripture, actually came from his heart. This is what you see in the image, the divine mercy image. The blood and the water came from his heart. Now, why the blood and the water? Because Satan only has two tools. His two tools, as I just said, one is sin, and what did I say the other day is the result of sin? Why did Jesus die on the cross? The result of sin is death. Jesus conquered it when he resurrected. So these two rays help us see that. First ray, the pale ray, is the water. See it coming out of his heart? That ray wipes out Satan's first great tool, which is sin. So sin is wiped out in the cleansing waters of baptism and confession. In baptism, it's real water. In confession, it's the cleansing waters of absolution. Satan's second great tool, which is caused by sin, is death. And that is wiped out by what? Life. And what's life to the Jews? Blood. The Jews believe blood was the life of the being. That's why they eat koshered meat. They don't eat the blood of the animals. 
And so the blood is what wipes out Satan's other great tool, which is death. And that, my friends, is the two tools of Satan wiped out by the blood and the water that come from the sacred heart. Now look at one more time on that image. Notice the left foot of Jesus is always stepping forward. Here is important because divine mercy is not just about our devotion to God, it's about God's devotion to us. And he comes forward. And he's stepping out of the darkness to come get us. All you have to do is reach out to that hand. All you got to do is grab it. All you got to do. This is amazing. This is the image of divine mercy. In that foot, Jesus is coming forward. He's saying, take my hand. He's coming towards us. In the sacred heart, God said, I am love. Come to me. But in the divine mercy, it completes and fulfills the sacred heart. God's love is put into action. Remember I said on the first day, what is mercy? Love is a particular mode, excuse me, mercy is a particular mode of love that when love encounters suffering, it takes action to do something about it. Jesus is doing that right now by stepping forward in this image to come get you to take you through the doors of heaven on the eighth day on Divine Mercy Sunday. But you got to be spotless to get into heaven and to be spotless, you go to confession and communion. That is what you do on Divine Mercy Sunday. That's how you get cleansed. That's how you go through the door. This image makes it possible. We see it happening. Now I got a couple more things on the image I want to show you. The next slide is the three images of Divine Mercy. Now I want you to tell me which one is the best image. That first image is the image of divine mercy that's over the grave of St. Faustina. That second image is our most popular. It's a blue image. We call it the blue hyla. People say, oh, Father, Jesus looks a lot more friendly there. He looks really happy. I like that one the best. Or the image on the right we call the skemp image. That image was commissioned by Father Seraphim, which is actually the most accurate. You see that rays are more like 3D. They're kind of coming out. That's how the rays were. Now, what's interesting is this image of divine mercy. Which one is the best? They all have the same amount of grace. There's no one better than another. Now, Jesus makes many promises through this image. And I'm going to have Brother Mark switch to another photograph right now. Some of you may have seen my video the last couple days, and we played it at the end of today's Mass. And this video is about a story of a woman. We had sent a video out a few months ago saying, it's called Seal the Doorpost, and it's saying that Jesus made many promises for the protection of your home and your family if you put the image of divine mercy on the door. Now, this woman here in Massachusetts had put an image on the door and then it got weathered. Now, in that same video, I told people that you can actually bless your own image of divine mercy. It says so in the catechism. The laity, if no priest is available, can do a blessing of religious, small religious items. Now, you can't bless a basilica, but you can bless an image of divine mercy. So in this video a few months ago, I told people, hang this image on your door and do a blessing. Well, that image or that video which circulated around the world for a few months. And then we got an email and a text from a friend of our religious community that knows one of our Polish priests very well. And she said that she took the image down because it was weathered, but because it was blessed, she burned it. And don't worry, that is the proper way to dispose of any blessed article. And when she burned it, take a look at your screen. This is the ash, not the picture. The picture was completely burned. All that was left was the ash. Now notice we got two slides here. Notice the first one is a very clear image of divine mercy. And look at the second one. The second one also shows that this is not paper anymore. The paper's been completely burned. It is an ash. And she said, look at the image never burned. Now, every time that I completely burn something, the image burns. But I, and I'm not promising, please don't take all your images of divine mercy and burn them up or, or grab every religious item you have that's been blessed, especially your home. My goodness, don't do this and try to burn them because the father said they won't burn. Uh-uh, I'm not saying that. 
I'm just telling you what happened to one individual woman who we believe this was a miraculous image. She burned it and the image didn't burn. So our priest told her to then print out from her same printer another image, but this time not blessed, not blessed, and to burn it and see the effects. Now look at your screen now. Now you see this is a picture of what that image actually looked like that was not blessed when she burned it. It's completely disintegrated. There's no signs of the image of divine mercy. Is this not amazing? Again, I'm not saying go home and burn everything you have because it won't burn if it's blessed. No, this was just a particular time I believe that God gave and showed a miracle. Just happens to be a miraculous image of somebody that's sent to us. All right, so let's, we're running out of time now. So let's, we got the two big ones out of the way. Remember, we're doing Finch here, F-I-N-C-H. We covered F, the Feast of Divine Mercy. We covered I, the Image of Divine Mercy. Let's go on to the next slide, which is N, the Novena of Divine Mercy. Now, the, the Novena of Divine Mercy, as you see on your screen, you can get this pamphlet on shopmercy.com. It tells you what to pray for in the Divine Mercy Novena. Now, this is interesting because what is a Novena? A Novena is a traditional prayer in the Catholic Church of nine days of prayer. And it comes from the tradition of the Apostles and Mary being in the upper room for nine days. Guess when? You got it. Between the Ascension and Pentecost... So after Jesus ascended to the Father, and then at Pentecost, he sent the Holy Spirit down. Mary and the apostles were in the room in prayer for nine days. That tradition has become known as a novena. So when you have a, a need, you pray a novena. Like if you have cancer, who do you pray a novena to? St. Peregrine. If you lose something, like Father Allen. Father Allen has lost, please pray to St. Anthony for him. He's probably lost at least 50 sets of keys since I've known him as a priest and brother, now I'm no better. I lose everything I have too. I'd lose my head if it wasn't attached. So who do we pray to? St. Anthony. Now what makes a novena to divine mercy different than any of those other novenas in the Catholic Church? The, mer the divine mercy novena is the only novena we have that is for God's intentions, not our intentions. So instead of saying, help me find something I lost or my friend, you're praying nine particular days of requests that our Lord gave for intentions. Like pray for priests and brothers or priests and religious. Pray for the lukewarm sinner. They need prayers. So this is what makes the novena special. Very special. I, you know, I had a friend in North Carolina. I need to call them um, Dom and Barb. They're like my parents down in... Uh, in uh, North Carolina, and um, uh, Palzola is their last name, and God bless them. And one of my favorite stories ever was Barb um, and Dom, uh, just great people. She had a real devotion to St. Anthony, and her little granddaughter at the time was small, and she gave her a little bracelet. And this little bracelet meant everything to Barb, and she never took it off. And one day she was cooking in the kitchen and she noticed the bracelet was not on her hand. So who did she begin a novena to? You got it, St. Anthony. So she prayed this nine days of the novena. And on the ninth day, she went to bed and as she's laying down, she's talking to St. Anthony and she says, okay, St. Anthony, this is the ninth day of the novena. I totally believe that when I wake up and turn on this light, that bracelet's gonna be on this dresser because I'm praying a novena to you. So she turns out the light, she goes to bed and she wakes up, she turns on the light and guess what she saw? Nothing. There was no bracelet at all. So she prayed the novena a second time and again, nothing. And then she prayed the novena a third time and this time she's really getting upset with St. Anthony because again, they don't find the bracelet Third time she prays the novena, she looks up at St. Anthony. She says, St. Anthony, that's it. We're through. We are done. You co I counted on you. I, I, I prayed to you. You're supposed to find these lost things. I trusted in you. Nothing. You know how much that bracelet meant to me. It was precious. And all of a sudden, her husband calls her from 
excuse me, in the, from the uh, kitchen and says, breakfast, we got to start breakfast now. So Dom goes in and the husband and Barb, the wife, and they start in the kitchen and Barb's working on the uh, uh, pancakes. And they had the pancake batter in a pitcher and it's sitting on the stove and Barb's moving around the kitchen and she knocks over the uh, pitcher and dumps the batter for the pancakes all over the range top. So Dom is groaning and says, oh boy, I got to clean it up now. So they clean it up, but guess what? It went all the way down into the burners, right into the stove. Dom had to disassemble the entire range top, had to pull out the burners and all the stuff and had to pull it out. And guess what he found? That bracelet had fallen off of Barb's wrist and went down into the stove. They never, ever, ever would have found it had she not knocked over that pitcher of pancake batter and Dom was home to have to disassemble the stove to get it, and they found it. So the moral to the story is novenas are powerful, especially the Divine Mercy novena. And Barb, after she got the bracelet, Dom looked at her and said, Barb, what is this? And Barb took the bracelet, and she looked up, and she said, I'm sorry, St. Anthony. So they're back on good terms. But anyway, a great story that I think is very powerful. All right, let's go to the next slide. We're wrapping up here. F-I-N, what is C? F is the feast, I is the image, N is the novena, C is the chaplet of divine mercy. This is a great intercessory prayer, and Jesus makes many promises through it. This promise of this chaplet is a prayer that you see on regular rosary beads. If you don't know how to say the chaplet, you can find it on our website, thedivinemercy.org. Let's go to the next slide. There's many promises that Jesus makes through this. Let's read this slide. This is one of my favorite quotes from the, the diary as well. This is diary 687. Let's read this. Priests will recommend it to sinners as their last hope of salvation. Even if there were a sinner most hardened, if he were to recite this chaplet only once, he would receive grace from my infinite mercy. I desire to grant unimaginable graces to souls who trust in my mercy. This is powerful. This is the chaplet. You know, the chaplet is a, is a, is a great prayer. Um, in fact, a lot of people ask us, Father, how can I make this prayer? Eternal Father, I offer you the body, blood, soul, and divinity. I can't do that. I'm not God. You said only God offers God to God or the priest at the mass. I'm not a priest. Oh, really? Are you a priest? Well, you might not be a, magister or a ministerial priest like me. They can do confessions and communions, of course, but by virtue of your baptism, every one of you listening right now, you share in the three offices of Christ, priest, prophet, and king. You are a prophet. You teach about the ways of the Lord, your friends and family. You are a king. You govern your body and holiness and your, and your family and in the faith. But you're also a priest. And a priest offers sacrifice. So when you pray, eternal father, I offer you the eternal, excuse me, I offer you the body, blood, soul, and divinity of your dearly beloved son. You are offering sacrifice. And people always say to me, father, if I can't make mass, what's the next best thing? Now, if you can't make mass and it was a Sunday and your church was open, the next best thing is confession. But if you can't make daily mass, what's the next best thing? Pray the rosary and pray the chaplet. Why? Because the mass is divided into two parts, the liturgy of the word and the liturgy of the Eucharist. What is the liturgy of the word, the first part of the mass? It's a meditation on scripture. When we read from the Bible at mass, we're reading from scripture and we meditate on scripture. What is the rosary? It's not a bunch of Hail Marys. It's a meditation on scripture. You don't sit there and just go, Hail Mary, full grace, Hail Mary, full grace, like the story I tell of my family. No, it's, it's, yeah, it could be like a machine gun, as I said before, shooting the Hail Marys like bullets into the devil, as my mom said. 
But the rosary is a meditation on scripture. The visitation of Mary, the annunciation of the angel Gabriel, the carrying of the cross by Jesus. These are all scriptural, the scourging at the pillar, the agony in the garden. These are all scriptural mysteries. The, the, the Hail Marys are just background music, so don't let any non-Catholics say the rosary's vain, repetitious prayer. First of all, it is in vain. Meditation on scripture is not vain. And secondly, repetition is allowed. We say it in the book of Revelation. Holy, holy, holy. Lamb of God, Lamb of God, Lamb of God. Repetitious prayer that's vain is not allowed, but this is not vain. The Jews, when they repeat a thing, because they have no superlative, they don't have good, better, best, they would repeat it. Something that was holy, they would say holy. Something that was holier, they would say holy, holy. Something that was the holiest, like God, they say holy, holy, holy. So you see, we are repeating the Hail Marys as background music. The rosary is actually listening or meditating on scripture. So if you miss mass, the next best thing is pray a rosary. It's like liturgy of the word. It's meditation on scripture. Second, you pray the chaplet because the second part of mass is the liturgy of the Eucharist. And as I just said, when you pray the chaplet, you exercise your priesthood and it is like liturgy of the Eucharist. The priest you, by the common priesthood you share, are offering sacrifice. So you offer sacrifice as a share of your common priesthood. You are priest, prophet, and king. You're not ministerial priest, but you share in the common priesthood of Christ. Powerful stuff. All right, now, this is powerful. Let's go to the next and final slide for the finch. And what do you see on your screen? The hour of mercy. Now, who put that Michigan clock on there? No, I'm not sure. No, just kidding. That stands for Mary. I always say the M stands for Mary, right? Not Michigan. All right. Either way, what time is the three o'clock hour? The three o'clock hour, of course, is 3 p.m. Now, what's interesting is the 3 p.m. hour we honor because that's the hour Jesus died on the cross. And Jesus tells us in the three o'clock hour to meditate on his passion. So how? What does he say to us to do at the three o'clock hour? Well, peeps, mostly people say pray the chaplet. No, that's not what he said, actually. He said, first pray for the conversion of sinners. And he said, how to do that? First do the stations of the cross. If you can't do that, then meditate briefly on his passion. Or excuse me, go into a church or chapel and meditate on his passion. If you can't do that, stop wherever you are for but a moment and reflect again on his passion. Why do we pray the chaplet at the three o'clock hour? Because it's about his passion. That's why. All right. You guys are going to get excited. We're in the home stretch now. Next slide, I think is very powerful. Let's read it together. Jesus said, I am giving mankind the last hope of salvation. That is recourse to my mercy. All right. What is recourse to God's mercy? For the last two Saturdays, we've been telling you. Last Saturday, and if you didn't see it, you can go back and get it or get our DVD. Last Saturday was ABCs. Ask for God's mercy. Be merciful to each other. Completely trust in God's mercy. We need all three to get to heaven. So right now I'm recapping for you. I'm recapping for you the two last Saturdays. Those known as the ABCs. A, ask for God's mercy. B, be merciful to each other. And C, completely trust in God's mercy are what we call the message of divine mercy. Pope Benedict said the message of divine mercy is the nucleus of the gospel. You cannot reject that. For all the priests that say we don't need divine mercy, they're technically correct if they talk in devotion, but not the message. The message is mandatory. You don't get to heaven without ABC. A, ask for God's mercy, Jesus said, or the scripture says, if you don't repent and ask for mercy and forgiveness, you don't enter into the kingdom of heaven. B, be merciful to each other. Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats, which you don't do for the least of my brethren, you don't do for me, away with you into the fire. We gotta be merciful to each other. That is B, be merciful. And C is completely trust in God's mercy. And Jesus said, 
that the vessel by which all grace is received is trust. In other words, you want to get to heaven? I do. You need grace. You want grace? You got to trust. Jesus said, trust is a vessel by which all grace is received. So those three ABCs God gave us from the beginning in the garden of Adam and Eve. For centuries, he's been trying to raise up great saints and prophets to give it back to us so that we live it, but we don't. Finally, he raised up a great saint named St. Faustina. And he said, I want you to teach the message of mercy anew to the world. Give it back to the world anew. She said, how, Lord? He said, I'm going to give you five new channels of grace. That channels are Finch, F-I-N-C-H. We just went over them today. F is the feast of divine mercy. I is the image of divine mercy. N is the novena of divine mercy. C is the chaplet of divine mercy. And H is the hour of divine mercy. This is recourse to God's mercy. He just said, I am giving mankind the last hope of salvation. That is recourse to my mercy. John Paul II said, there is nothing the world needs today more than divine mercy. And he consecrated the world to divine mercy. Pope Benedict said, divine mercy is not a secondary devotion, but an integral part of Christian life and prayer. Pope Francis he went like this. He actually put his two fingers like this. He said, while the mercy of God is infinite, the time of mercy is not. And he went like this. He said, while the mercy of God is infinite, the time of mercy is not. He said, we are living on borrowed time. And he declared the year of mercy. So this is our last three popes begging us to turn to the mercy of God. Jesus says it's mankind's last hope of salvation. Let's go to the next slide. Mankind will not have peace until it turns to the fount of my mercy. Jesus said, if you do not pass through the doors of my mercy, you must pass through the doors of my justice. I don't know about you all, but I'm not making it through the doors of justice. All God has to do is look at one day in my college fraternity career and down I would go. So God turns to us and says, you have the chance to walk through the doors of my mercy. Right now you need to do it because Jesus said after this comes a time of justice, it'll be too late. You have the chance to do it now. How do I do it, Father? You're starting right now by watching this video. If you do what we said in this video, you will find eternal life. Not because it comes from me, but this is what Jesus directed through St. Faustina and the scriptures and the Holy Bible and the sacraments. Now, Faustina prepared the world, Jesus said. He said, you, St. Faustina, will prepare the world for my final coming. John Paul II, when St. Faustina was canonized in 2000. After the canonization, our priests and brothers, I wasn't there yet, I wasn't a Marian, attended a reception with John Paul II the day St. Faustina was canonized. And John Paul said something startling. He stood up the night that she was canonized and he said, the reason I believe I was made Pope was to canonize St. Faustina and to institute the feast of divine mercy. This is the happiest day of my life. Can you imagine that? All the things John Paul II did, all his encyclicals, meetings, writings, books, everything. And he said the reason he was made Pope was to canonize this little saint who he called nobody from nowhere. And he said, this was the happiest day of my life. And as I said, when did he die? He died on Divine Mercy Sunday after receiving a Binda confession and receiving Holy Communion. This is the promise Jesus offers. My goodness, it's almost like Jesus rewarded him for all the work he did by going to confession and receiving Holy Communion. I think he went straight to heaven. So this is incredible stuff. Two slides to go. Let's look at the next one. Jesus said, this is why, or I should say, this is why Jesus said, I have eternity for punishing, so I am prolonging the time of mercy. 
for the sake of sinners, but woe to them if they do not recognize this time of my visitation. Thank God you recognize this time of his visitation or you wouldn't be watching this video. The very fact that God put it on your heart to watch this video or to send it on to somebody else who will watch it later, it means God is working in your heart and wants you to have eternal life. He is seeking you out like the shepherd looking for the one lost sheep. And he's given you the tools to get there. Divine mercy. I know this is a lot, but watch this video over again. It'll be posted on our YouTube channel, Divine Mercy, or on our Facebook page, Divine Mercy Official, or our webpage. Best of all, go to thedivinemercy.org and you'll find all these talks. Please don't let this time of mercy slip by. So I'm going to finish with a one minute video and then we're going to close with a prayer for the United States here on July 4th. Let us watch this last video that's one minute long that summarizes divine mercy. It was to this novice considered no one special by her superior that Jesus Christ would quietly entrust a great mission. Christ instructed Faustina to remind the world about God's unfathomable mercy. She was to accomplish this by introducing new devotional practices to honor mercy and by establishing a worldwide movement of souls dedicated to spreading divine mercy. Jesus directed Faustina to proclaim to the world that even the worst and most hopeless sinner was deserving of God's infinite mercy. It is divine mercy, he said, that will determine the future destiny of the world. Speak to the world about my mercy. Let all mankind recognize my unfathomable mercy. It is a sign for the end times. After it will come the day of justice. While there is still time, let them have recourse to the fount of my mercy. Wow, that is a great one minute clip that summarizes everything. And so when I finish now with a final blessing and prayer for our country on this, the 4th of July, I would ask all of you to just do a few things. Number one, this is such an important message. Please share this talk and videos with your friends and loved ones. If you can't, please get the DVD series. As I said before in the video or the slide we showed in the very beginning of the talk, if you go to thedivinemercy.org slash explaining the faith, you can get it live streamed or there on the top of your screen. If you want the actual DVD, go to shopmercy.org or call 1-800-462-7426 to get the actual video. Second, I talked quite a bit about the image of divine mercy and the importance of having that image blessed. Now, I'm sorry I don't have a slide for this, but there is a link that you can type on your computer to get a free five by seven divine mercy image blessed by me personally, and it's very easy. Sorry I didn't have a slide for this, but you can easily remember it. It's the divinemercy.org slash image. So the divine mercy, one word, T-H-E-D-I-V-I-N-E-M-E-R-C-Y dot org slash image. And on that, I think we may have it up on the screen now, you can go and simply give us your name. We'll send you a free all postage paid, no cost of the image, no cost of postage. I'll send it to you for free. God has been so good to us. I want to give this to everyone in the world who asks for it. I will personally bless this image if you go to thedivinemercy.org slash image 
and I will send you a free five by seven to place on your door and you can get that and I will personally bless it. So that is very, very special. So hopefully you'll do that. Join us next week as I believe, and please, I'm not sure we have the issue. We have a thing. I think I'm going to be talking about the connection of the shroud of divine mercy, excuse me, the shroud of Turin and the image of divine mercy. I believe that's next week. I have a schedule printed on our website. You can find it. But tune in next week at the same time, 11 o'clock Eastern time, and you will be shocked at the beautiful connection between the image of divine mercy and the shroud of Turin. You don't want to miss it. Please spread the word. We're going to be really focused on this next week. Great stuff. All right, today is July 4th, and we want to finish with a prayer for our nation. And so I ask you all as we continue, and please join us at three o'clock because in the three o'clock hour, I will be also doing a holy hour today live broadcast where we'll pray, pray the chaplet, expose the blessed sacrament, do benediction, and we'll have more short talk on our nation, on our prayers that we need for our country today. And we'll tell some stories and we'll also do a prayer to consecrate ourselves to God through the request of our Blessed Mother Mary to pray for our nation. So let us finish today praying Our Lady of the Americas prayer for our country. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of Mercy, at this most critical time, we entrust the United States of America to your loving care. Most Holy Mother, we beg you to reclaim this land for the glory of your Son, Overwhelmed with the burden of the sins of our nation, we cry to you from the depths of our hearts and seek refuge in your motherly protection. Look down with mercy upon us and touch the hearts of our people. Open our minds to the great worth of human life and to, be respons and to the responsibilities to accompany human freedom. Free us from the falsehoods that lead to the evils and threaten the sanctity of human life. Grant our country the wisdom to proclaim that God's law is the foundation on which this nation was founded and that he alone is the true source of our cherished rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. O oh, merciful mother, give us the courage to reject the culture of death and to strengthen and build a new culture of life. Amen. May God have mercy on our land and not just the United States. Mercy on all of you listening from around the world, from Asia to Africa, to the Middle East, to South America, to North America and beyond. May God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we'll see you next week. God bless you. Do you realize that St. Faustina had a vision of all Marian helpers back in April of 1936? Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy. And if you're already a Marian helper or you become a Marian helper, St. Faustina saw you in her vision. Let's listen to her words. St. Faustina said that the Lord Jesus revealed to her many things concerning the future among others, the creation of an association of lay people, which was to deal with the propagation of the devotion of divine mercy. She said, one more word, Father. I see clearly that not only will there be a male and a female congregation, but I can see that there will be a huge association of lay persons to which anyone can belong and by deed remind others of God's mercy particularly showing mercy to one another. Trusting in God entirely, St. Faustina remained convinced that this divine work would one day come about. So it is clear that St. Faustina was talking here about the association of Marian helpers. Why be a Marian helper? The first reason that you should want to join the Association of Marian Helpers at no cost is because we Marian Fathers celebrate a Mass for you and all our members each and every day. Remember, the saints tell us that one Mass during our lifetime is worth more than a hundred Masses after we die. And these are the graces we are going to need to get to heaven. 
Reason number two to be a Marian Helper, you can share in all the prayers, good works, and merits of all the Marian priests and brothers around the world. You know, our Catholic faith teaches to get to heaven, we need faith and good works. So if you're not able to go around the world doing these good works, we can. And now you can share the graces just as if you were a Marian priest or brother. Reason number three to be a Marian helper is because you can share in the graces of a mass said on the feast days of our Savior and our Blessed Mother. Remember, there is no more powerful grace in this world than that of the infinite mass, and especially mass is said on the feast days of our Savior and Mother Mary. Reason number four to why to be a Marian helper is because you can share in the graces of a mass said every month on the first Friday and first Saturday. Remember, Mother Mary told us at Fatima the importance of the five first Saturday devotions, and we know through the devotion to the Sacred Heart the importance of first Fridays. We at the Marian Fathers will offer these Masses for our members of our association and you can share in those graces. Reason number five why to be a Marian Helper is because every All Souls Day we see a Mass for all the deceased members of the Association of Marian Helpers. Again, there's no way that after we die we can help ourselves, but we have to rely on the prayers of those here on earth and we members of the Marian Fathers will be praying for you as a deceased member of our association. And reason number six to be a Marian helper is you can share in the graces of the perpetual novena to the divine mercy. Remember Jesus told St. Faustina that the chaplet of divine mercy is one of the most powerful prayers we can make. And every day here at the shrine of divine mercy, we pray it and you can share in those graces. You know now there are a number of reasons why you should be a Marian helper. In addition to all the graces that you can get through our masses, our rosaries, our chaplets of divine mercy, our prayers and our penances, there's the fact that you can share in the special family that we have as Marian fathers and Marian helpers. You see, there is nothing more important than praying for each other. And when you become a Marian helper, and there is no cost, we pray for you every day and you'll pray for us, we hope, because it'll help each other get to heaven. So if you have any questions or you want to learn more how to be a Marian Helper, please visit micprayers.com or call 1-800-462-7426 and let me personally pray for you and your loved ones. Thank you and may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.